Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. Thank you, as always, for listening. This episode features Ashif Lalani and Charlie Frischer. Ashif and Charlie joined to pitch Fairfax. I don't normally do single stock episodes, but Ashif has been wanting to talk to me about Fairfax for a while. And I said, why don't you come on the pod and do it? And then he roped in Charlie, who brought a lot of data. And I always appreciate that. I hope I did a decent job of pushing back. I don't think it needs to be said, but if you hear a pitch on a podcast, you should do your own work and verify everything that you have. Make sure you're comfortable with anything. This is all opinion and for entertainment purposes only, as you know. This episode is sponsored by DeLupa. I like DeLupa. I was working with DeLupa's spreadsheet today on Disney, and it really illuminated how many financial disclosures have changed in Disney's disclosures. Makes it real fun. But I digress. I would not know that, let's say I was new to Disney and I pulled it up. I wouldn't know how many things have changed if I didn't have DeLupa's model, which shows me all of the disclosures going back to, got it right in front of me, 2012 we got data back to. So if you'd like to know the official read, buckle up. DeLupa is founded by a former hedge fund analyst to bring simplicity into the investment process. DeLupa offers an AI-driven single source for all company reported data and allows for investment teams to make the most informed decisions in the shortest amount of time. DeLupa scales the velocity of an investment team's idea gen. Analysts spend less time locating and manually inputting meaningful disclosures into Excel and more time synthesizing in the minutes after the print. DeLupa captures data from all company reported sources, including from footnotes, MDNAs, and investor presentations. DeLupa's data sheets include gap to non-gap adjustments, guidance, and all company-specific KPIs. Each data point is auditable to the source for easy verification and accuracy. DeLupa's Excel plugin can also update your existing models for the latest quarter in just a single click. Bulge bracket banks and major multi-managers are trusting DeLupa for use in initiating coverage, building and maintaining industry dashboards, and keeping their models up to date. Visit delupa.com forward slash business brew to create a free account and learn more about how Delupa can help increase your team's speed to differentiated insight. There you go. As always, none of this is investment advice. Everything in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions. Do your own due diligence and enjoy the episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, excited to be joined by uh, Charlie and Ashif. Who uh, we met at, I mean, we physically met at Markel, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was a good time, right? Shout out to Tom and the gang. You did a great job on the panel. Thank you. I think uh, I think Bob's got a cool thing going, you know, and uh, I'm just trying to free ride on it. And so far, so good. Bob's great. I, I think I think he sees the world um, pretty similarly to how we see it. Yeah. Well, we will get into that. Uh, the background on this episode is uh, Ashif and I have talked since, I want to say 2020. Was that when we had our first call? Probably, yeah. And um, I don't know, we were, we were going back and forth and you said, you know, if you ever want to hear about Fairfax, now's the time. And I said, okay, well, let's hear about it. And uh, I sent out a tweet to try to get some, um, some pushback because I've been limited in... Uh, in my background time. So we'll, we'll see how you handle the pushback and, um, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll see where the conversation goes, but I have a feeling it'll be a good one. I've enjoyed hanging out with you guys. So let's hit it. You want to give your backgrounds? Sure. Charlie, why don't you go first? So I'm 56, done investing for a long time. Uh, I was thinking about getting ready for this podcast. So I met, uh, the, the background here is interesting. I think most value investors, they kind of start off with a you know, and, and when I was kind of kicking in with a dose of Buffett um, and you start off with Buffett and then you end up in Omaha. And then from there, you start to figure out, well, you like Buffett and what else looks like Buffett. So my first uh, annual meeting was in 98. And I, in 99, I was in Borsheim's hanging around and a friend was talking to Steve Markell and he knew I'd be interested. So I ended up uh, talking to Steve in 99 and got to know him and then ended up going to his Sunday um, meetings and met Tom and went down to a handful of the annual meetings uh, in Richmond and got to know those guys. It's a little smaller then, but uh, very nice and very, uh, very sharing. It was really a nice group of people to get to know. And I ended up uh, also learning about Fairfax and being a, 
it's probably sometime around 2001 or two, also being a Fairfax shareholder. Then I also used to go to uh, David Schiff's insurance conference, which is kind of, a, David's a very smart guy. He used to write a great newsletter. He stopped writing the newsletter maybe 10 years ago, but he would have uh, terrific uh, in, insurance analyst days where he would have a, a whole bunch of people from the industry. We'd have executives and investors come and uh, he didn't do that anymore, but it was remarkably interesting and, and a really good group of people. It was more industry people than investors. And they would look at me and I was doing uh, mortgage banking at the time. And people would say, why are you here? And I said, I don't know. I'd like insurance companies. And then would they ask what's wrong with you or uh, what, would, what would they say? So you're a glutton for punishment? Exactly. So anyway, lo and behold, I was working for a private equity firm uh, in New York in, in, two, in 2008. And uh, I wanted to, we were trying to buy real, real property. And uh, I, I wanted to buy stocks in the stock market because you could buy them a lot cheaper. There were discounted stocks in the stock market you could buy. So anyway, I, I ended up work, going on my own in 2009 and uh, just been managing money since. And uh, just kind of hanging around, hanging around the hoop. And uh, so it's been off and on for me going back to Fairfax. I, I've owned the stock, uh, you know, get over over time for, for a big part, part of the last 20 years. It's been a big part of my portfolio for the last three or four years, for sure. And it's still, as of today, it's my my biggest holding. Um, Kingsway, I'm on, the, I'm on the board, is probably my second biggest holding. So um, that's kind of, I'm happy to talk about more, but why don't we talk, send it over to That's Chief. interesting. I should have known that you were on the board of Kingsway, but uh, alas, I, okay. I, uh, I did not. Oh, well. Yeah, so um, for me, um, to my background, I, I have a much shorter history of Fairfax. But my background is uh, initially um, CACPA up, up in Toronto. I uh, worked for PwC until 2002, uh, and then went to UBS, um, worked in equity research and, um, as a desk analyst for uh, a year, um, and then went over to the prop desk. Um, and our prop desk was set up as a long, short hedge fund. So we dealt with the street. Uh, we took very long-term positions. The The concept was uh, invest like Buffett, um, but make money every day, which is really, really hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, we did okay until, until 08. Um, we lost some money that year. And in 2012, we had the vocal rule come in. Um, at the time, I was um, I moved back from New York. Uh, I went to New York from 06 to 08 to work with the team there. Um, started running my own uh, my own long short book and helped with risk arb uh, for Canadian positions. And then came back to Canada um, and eventually ended up running that group from 2010 to 2012. And then the vocal rule came in, and uh, I got let go. And um, honestly, I couldn't find any place that would give me the responsibility I had, and so I just decided to uh, keep doing what I was doing on my own. And, um, and it's worked out pretty well so far. So it's been 11 years and, um, I've compounded about 17%, you know, obviously not audited, <laughs> uh, and no performance fees or anything like that off of that or management fees, but, um, but it's been good enough to, uh, to let me keep doing it, which is, uh, which is really all I want to do. Nice. Um, do you, do you both focus primarily on financials or will you go anywhere? We will go anywhere. Um, I think, I think, I think the approach is, um, an expected value approach. So the approach is basically just looking for great risk rewards, um, sector agnostic, uh, market cap agno agnostic, uh, liquidity agnostic. I mean, the list goes on and on. We're in a lot of small things in some cases. And, and then, um, you know, both of our biggest positions are, are Fairfax, which is my most liquid position by a, by a wide margin, but probably not liquid enough for a lot of big funds. Hmm. To be Why is it not liquid enough for big funds? I mean, it seems like a huge company. It just doesn't trade enough. Yeah, it trades. It trades forty thousand shares a day um, or so. It's really not that many, and and it, I think that's a signal of um, how far away we're trading from intrinsic value. Um, because you know you just have your when you're trading close to intrinsic value, it's much easier to trade around a position. But when you're so far away, it's it's probably not going to happen because if you have good shareholders, they're going to want to hold on to their shares. Um, so I think I think that's what uh, that is. But you know I. When I got really bullish on Fairfax um, after after Charlie mentioned uh, in early 21 how their portfolio was running so far ahead of what where their book value was um, because I mean, as the market was bouncing, Fairfax you know wasn't bouncing. Um, so that's when that's when I got uh, involved, and it's it's and when that happened, I was like you know I'm getting so bullish on this thing. And it's, over time, I, I tried to see if I could get options listed on the T, on the TSX for Fairfax. Contact all my brokers. I contact the Montreal Exchange. Uh, unfortunately, they said it was too illiquid to list options, um, and, I, and I think that's that's a signal that probably keeps a lot of the institutionals uh, out of it. Um, for, you know, foreign institutions, the Canadians have to buy it because it's part of the index. 
Uh, so it's a little bit of a, of a different uh, a different thing for Canadian investors. Charlie, do you focus on, I know you said that you're interested in financial or insurance and you're on the board of Kingsway, which leads me to to think you spend a lot of time on financials, but... Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable around financials. I I'd really like to buy tons of real estate. In in my you know a long time ago, maybe ten or fifteen, twenty years ago, I used to own a bunch of REITs. Um, I'd like to buy them. They don't seem all that interesting to me. I own uh, a couple of things, but nothing of size or of significance. I own some consolidated communications, and I've written a public letter recently, and that's a telecom company. I've owned Spectrum stocks before. Um, I'm willing to kind of. I'm dumb enough to go lots of places. Maybe I shouldn't go. The real estate and, and financials, I certainly feel really comfortable on the insurance side. I really feel comfortable, um, but I'm willing to go other places. All right. Uh, you know, it was interesting. It's, um, it's somewhat difficult to do this, like uh, host this conversation because you're supposed to criticize by category, but uh, we're talking about a specific stock here. So I kind of have to bring up some people's criticism. So Prem, forgive me, should you listen? Um, but you know, it, it sounds, it sounds to me like the, the common objection, uh, comes down to with Fairfax specifically comes down to, to really trust, uh, is how I would say it. And, you know, the people have criticized, um, you know, whether or not they're reserving enough in the loss ratios and, you know, for me, my only experience with it is I went up to the 2019, I think it was 2019. Investor Day could have been a little earlier, but I remember Prem saying, I'm done with macro. And then he went on to talk about macro for 50 minutes. Uh, and I was like, OK, well, how done is he really with macro? And and kind of I've watched from afar, but I've never really dug in. Um, I, w I was impressed with the list of companies that they have. I didn't realize that they had that many portfolio companies. You know, when you're walking through the convention center, there's a lot that are set up, but I haven't done, I haven't really done deep work. And, and part of it, uh, honestly, is I'm not sure that I really want to, um, but I, I am open to being wrong on it. Uh, so hence, hence uh, this conversation. So, you know, you saw, you saw, I mean, I sent you those, the tweets. I mean, what, what's your general feeling of, you know, are they conservative in how they reserve? Are they in line with the industry? Just kind of like starting from what they do and how, how they're able to underwrite well from your perspective. Uh, Ashif, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think, I think there's um, some evidence that they are, um, are very uh, aggressive on reserving. Um, and that evidence comes from the, the most recent IFRS 17 change, right? I don't know if you're familiar, but um, IFRS 17 was a new um, policy that was put in. And because Fairfax is listed in Canada, uh, they have to follow it. And, um, and under IFR 17, um, you know, they were forced to take the present value of their reserves and, uh, and, and that decreased the amount of reserves, which increased the book value. Um, and their book value went up by over a hundred dollars at the beginning of this year, uh, by making that, making that change to IFR 17. I think that showed that they actually are reserving pretty aggressively. If the present value, just present value in the reserves causes your book value to go up a hundred bucks is a pretty good indicator that you're probably pretty good at reserving. Um, and because the duration of the viabilities is, is longer term, um, that means you're holding on to that float, you know, a lot longer as well. So there's some mitigation as well, just from, from that alone. Uh, and now that float is valuable again, it, it, it does change that dynamic. Um, Charlie, you're going to go. Yeah. Let's think about it. It went public 37 years ago in the insurance business. People talk about insurance triangles. To me, the number one thing in the insurance business is I don't want to buy a three-year-old insurance company because I don't know how they've done. They're going to produce some reserves. They're going to give you a little couple-year triangle. You're not going to have any clue. Uh, and insurance turnarounds are really hard for me as well because you, you're a crappy company. You bring a new CEO in. After a year or two, you start talking about how our, our numbers look better. But in a year or two, you can fudge any of the numbers. So. We, got, we have a 37-year track record here where book value has gone up at 18% a year. We're now at Fairfax, nor, you know, inside the 20th largest insurance company in the world. It, it is hard to do that if you've been running a scam for 37 years. You know, you can run a, you can run a, a shill for five or 10 years. It, it's hard for 37. So then um, in, the, in the annual report, actually, this year, Prem talked about Andy Bernard, who, who's a very good guy who runs their 
insurance, their, their whole operation. Um, they've had two years since 2010 where they didn't run at 100 combined, where they were north of 100. And then in every single year, they've had reserve redundancies. So I don't know. People can say that the reserve were un, under reserved or the like. But if we've had reserve redundancies for 13 years in a row, we run a positive combined. We have a 37 year track record. It, it is hard to ma- imagine what's the what's the grift. If you're if you're prem, you own two billion dollars worth of stock. What do you gain out of out of? He's not going to start selling tomorrow. So there's no there's no advantage for him to start behaving poorly. And you just don't get the motivation as to why people would behave like that. You, you know, we're not issuing stock. We're buying shares in. We're not in that kind of mode. We're not in a survival mode. The company appears to be really strong. Um, premiums were up 16% last year. So it is possible and it's always possible in the insurance business, um, but it doesn't seem all that likely. And if anything, the incentive is actually to reserve more to reduce taxes, right? If, you, if you're thinking about a value investor, that's what they should be doing. And I, I think that's what they are doing. Um, but, you know, there, there's always it's always going to be an open question because, you know, at the end of the day, we don't have access to all their policies or know exactly how they're writing all their business. Right. Um, and that's, that there is a leap of faith there for sure. There's also a tax reason. And um, 20 years ago, Joe Brandon gave a talk at the uh, David Schiff's conference and he said, under reserving is about the dumbest thing you can do in the insurance business, if, unless you have to, because when you overinsure, you pay less taxes today. And the worst comes to worst, you'll pay more taxes in 10 or 20 years or five years when you release the reserves. So you have absolutely no incentive I mean, if you're well run to to to, to uh, under reserve. It, it is crazy behavior. And and look, Prem's been at this for a long time. He he doesn't need to do it. It's simply just um, and, if, and if he screws up, we'll find out in two years or three years. Can you guys help me understand like uh, what the the typical i mean i know that it's a diverse insurance company but like where where do they really play and why is there an edge over time in what they're doing you know what i'm saying like like property and casualty right seems like a a market that people can enter it doesn't like specialty insurance makes sense to me um some of the more commoditized insurance companies don't and i'm just kind of curious what their insurance book looks like on average I think the thing that they're doing is 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 gaining um, scale, right? So you're you know you're looking at signing a business that can um, you know again in, in, in commodity lines, you know you're really you're going to benefit by having scale and writing good business. So your operating expenses are lower, which it makes your combined ratio better, right? So if you're if you're a good operator, if you're efficient, you're going to gain. It's going to help your combined ratio as well, right? And I think I think that's a big part of it. So I, a lot a lot of the lines that they they compete in are very competitive and they're commodity type. So it's really about going to where the pricing is, and when the pricing is not there, pulling back. And, and and you know most recently there's been um, the market's been hard. Um, it's been sort of the the view because across the industry combined ratios have been have been relatively high, um, and that seems to be continuing. And and they're kind of growing into into that. Um, which is uh, which is why I think the criticisms there that they're writing too much business, um, but the reason why they are growing as fast as they are when everyone else is kind of pulling back is because their 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 capital's in a better position because they had you know they took they made a macro bet I mean quite frankly you know they made a macro bet and they kept their duration uh, on their bond portfolio a lot lower than the duration of the uh, claims. Um, whereas a lot of their peers um, extended the duration and they could argue they were matching um, or they were trying to boost their current income um, and Fairfax was doing the opposite. Um, they realized that it was strategic to hold back, sacrifice the current income for the past few years um, and then make it so that they could grow when everyone else uh, couldn't. Um, now, they didn't know that was going to happen for sure, but it's a, it was a pretty good bet, I think. Yeah, I mean, definitely in retrospect, right? So, Bill, let's, if you don't mind, let's take one step back at Fairfax and just kind of frame it for somebody that that doesn't know the story. So we've got a Canadian insurance company where 75% is North American premiums and then the rest is is overseas of the of the 25 that's not in the in North America, about half is in Lloyds and then the other half is, is all over the world. We have 23 or so million shares. We've got about a 17 or 18 billion market cap. Book value as of the end of the first quarter is eight, just over eight hundred dollars. So, stock seven fifty, uh, 
7.30 today. So we're trading at about 90% 90, 90 of book value. If you look at a chart of where other people trade, AIG trades at 93%, and everybody else essentially is higher than us. Um, I'm just looking at my chart here. Markel's at 133. Um, Travel is at 160, you know, 165. Berkeley, great business, is at two. Chubbs at, at, at you know, one point, uh, Chubbs higher. So where I'm going, Chubbs at 1.8. So we, we are really cheap. And then you say, well, well, let's forget about why we're cheap. We'll get that in a second. Buffett, <clears throat> if you go back, and we've all read all these, all of Buffett's reports, 80% of the annual reports, there's a one or two page section on float. The value of float, what drew him to the insurance business was the float, 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 float. And he talks a lot about float. We, we have a remarkable amount of float that has grown really well. We're sitting on... 32 billion afloat. The last 10 years, we've been paid a small amount. We've 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 run at about a negative one percent. So we're getting paid about one percent to hold the money. That 32 billion will probably be 35 or 40 billion in five years. It's growing already. It's going to go through deals on the table. We're buying 50 percent of Gulf Insurance, which is a Middle Eastern insurance company, which we already own a big chunk, just under 50 percent of. And we're going to close that deal this year. And so. At, at Fairfax, not only are you getting, but you're getting our book value at a discount, but you're also getting 32 billion afloat, which, based on 23 million shares, um, we're, you know it's another almost 1,500 bucks. So, so you, now you've got over 2,000 dollars worth of assets kind of working for you, and you're paying 700 and change for them. So we we have tremendous operating leverage here on a couple of things. So. We bought Allied World in, uh, six years ago. There were three billion in premiums. There's six and a half billion today. So we own 83% of Allied. Omers, who's do we've done a bunch of deals with Omers because Premwasa has a really good relationship with the people at Omers, owns the other 13%. In the next year or two, we're gonna buy that back and take that in and we'll own 100%. We did the same thing with Brit and we did a, a, another deal with, uh, with, with Omers where they bought 10% of Odyssey for it from us at 180% a book. And we use that money to buy, all that capital was used to go buy uh, and fund an SIB at Fairfax a couple of years ago. So shares from 2017 to now, the share counts down 16%, floats up 36% per share, up 36%, uh, it's up 62 on a per share basis. Book is up 46% over the last six years. We're a big insurer all over the world. Our premiums are now twenty-four billion dollars this year, and 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 we're going to probably run it at ninety-five. So we are the business has never been any better. We you couldn't write the story and make the pieces so that Fairfax could do any better right now, in my opinion. And so so now where we are is this is where it really gets interesting. And, and the stocks had a run from five hundred to four hundred now to seven thirty. I think I would argue we're in the second or third inning. We're nowhere near even the halfway mark in terms of the run here. I think this is going to double or triple in the next five or 10 years without any trouble at all, maybe more. And where we are is on the $24 billion, we're likely going to run at a 95 combined, which gets us a billion, billion two of earnings. We have a bond portfolio that's about $40 billion where we're earning 5%. That's another $2 billion. So right there, you're, you're north of $3 billion. So where, where I think most people, the, the bulls on Fairfax are looking at this and saying, we're going to earn a, 150 bucks a share here based on just our, our income stream from our, from our bond portfolio, plus the underwriting. And then we're going to have another 10 or so billion dollars of assets where we don't know what those are going to do. Those could, go at, uh, those could go up at 5% a year. They go up at 10. They can go up at 15. They may go down. But if they have a reasonable return, you're going to be north of 150 bucks a share for the next two or three years. And given how many shares we have, we're probably talking, you know, 150. We're, we're talking probably close to three and a half, four million, four billion dollars a year of cash flow that's going to come into the parent. And they're going to get to do all sorts of interesting things with the money. And that's the part that really makes the story um, get interesting, Bill. And I, I think, you know, going back to where the conversation started, um, you know, I think that some of the bears might say, okay, well, 
all that is the the value of the money that's coming in is only as good as it's reinvested, right? So I I guess you know some of the splashier like comments that come back, uh, you know, the investment in BlackBerry, um, you know, I Resolute ended up working out. You know, it took a long time, but I don't know. I don't know what the 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 return profile of that looked like on a money weighted basis. I don't know what the return of it. Yeah, I, I think they broke even on Resolute. I don't think it was a good. So I think I think that's what comes up right a lot is just kind of what's he going to do with the capital. But I, I'll let you answer it. But I, I think it'd be interesting to hear you talk about that. I think the style of investing is out of favor, right? With Fairfax, I think I think that's 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 why it trades where it trades. Uh, I mean, the way I think Fairfax invests is similar to the way that we invest in in terms of uh, looking at expected value as opposed to looking at a bunch of uh, heuristics. So it's like more of a probabilistic method than a deterministic method. When you when you do that, you end up with uh, potential zeros and and what and trades that don't work out that well. Because you're not as focused on quality as you are on the return profile, um, and I think um, I think that's just out of favor. I think that's one of the reasons why Fairfax trades cheaply. It's like you said, people don't like what he's putting the money into. They they would prefer uh, him take all the capital and buy index funds with it because index funds have gone up a lot um, historically, and and that's what they want to do. And that's just not, you know, that's not true value investing. You know, that's. That that's not expected value investing. That 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 uh, it's just a different it's just a different game uh, that 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 you'd be playing if they did that. If you look at the portfolio that Fairfax has, there's a lot of really cheap stocks in the portfolio, and it's just math. Uh, if there's if there's positive cash flow and they're returning it to shareholders uh, for the holdings, or if they're growing very quickly, that those investments will go up in value. Um, so I think you have to have you have to be able to handle not every trade working out. The biggest, you know, it's it's funny because some of the biggest criticisms, you know, I think I think BlackBerry was um was was a choice where you know Prem put um, Canada maybe ahead of uh, its shareholders uh, ahead of uh, BlackBerry's uh, or Fairfax's shareholders, where he said, you know, even put it in his twenty in twenty eleven annual report, like we're down a lot on BlackBerry, and he put in in, in brackets, I, I'm, I was just trying to help, <laughs> you know, so like he 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 he, I think he knew. He was taking maybe a bigger risk than he should have on behalf of shareholders, but he was trying to do it, uh, I think, as a good corporate citizen. Um, and I know people won't like that. Maybe they won't ever want to invest, invest with him because of that. But if you look at the culture uh, at Fairfax, it's it's not surprising. They, they definitely put – they think about their stakeholders and not just their shareholders because they're thinking about the long-term benefits of, of, of doing uh, things like that. So I, I, I do think the it's an investment style um, thing. Uh, I, I just don't think people um, – I think people are very focused on quality, especially because the last um, you know five years, six years that we've had in the market where you've seen these amazing businesses like Google and Facebook and, and uh, or Meta um, um, uh, and, and, you know, go on and on with all these amazing business models where there's incredible economies of scale. Um, I think that has made everyone shift towards quality – where people are much more willing to value, um, you know, a twelve percent steady return over a, lu- a lumpy fifteen percent, uh, and I think with Fairfax, you're definitely going for the lumpy fifteen, but with the potential right tail, where it could be a lot higher than fifteen on any given year, and sometimes, you know, lower. Right? Uh, I think that's that's the risk that you're taking with the current setup. It's hard to see um, it being lower, uh, given how how big the float is, and I and I think. Just a minute on float again. I think people forgot how valuable float is because interest rates were zero for so long, um, and I think that's a big part of why um, you know the the picture is being missed here. I, I talked to I talked to so many investors, um, you know, people who are professional investors and, and lay people, and I try to explain float to them, and I can just see the blank stares I get back. Um, that you know, people really don't appreciate that when you buy Fairfax, you're actually buying two times the share price in T bills. And mortgages on 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 high quality properties. Um, so, I mean, a recent deal they did with Kenny Wilson and some other deals they had. They have quite a, a couple billion invested and in some high quality mortgages at a, at a relatively attractive LTV and really high rates. But most of the most of the floor portfolio is invested in T bills, and you're getting the income stream associated with that when you buy Fairfax. Um, even if you don't, you're not getting it all paid out out to you directly. That money is then being reinvested. Uh, and other things, um, some of which are obviously valuable, like the 13% allied world that they don't own. 
um, and some stuff that's more speculative. And and I think you have to be okay with owning a portfolio when you buy Fairfax. So, Bill, it's funny. People bring up BlackBerry. Now he's getting ready for the podcast. So BlackBerry now is a hundred and forty six million dollar common stock investment for for Fairfax. Okay, seven dollars a share. Yeah. So one yeah. percent. Micron Technology is one hundred and seventy one million. So you get more Micron if you said. Well, do you know anything about Micron and Fairfax? You're going to know about BlackBerry, and it's worth more Micron. We own 1.3 billion of Eurobank, which is probably the best run bank in Greece. We have a billion one of, of Atlas. We've got 400 billion, 400 million of Stelco. We have 550 million of Exco. Um, so the, the BlackBerry, for, for good or for bad, it's a meaningless investment now. Let, let's talk about something that did go well, which is Digit. So Kamesh Goyal is 56, 57 years old. Five years ago, four, six years ago, he started a digital insurance business in India where there's no paper. That was the goal. And he had his choice, a very well-known guy in India, very accomplished. He had his choice of who he could pick as partners, and he picked Prem. And Fairfax gave him $154 million. That position is now worth $2.3 billion. It's growing at premiums were up 50% last year. They did 900 million in premiums in 22. They are now the 400th largest company in India. They, the insurance market in India is growing and we're gaining market share in that space. So, and, and, I, and they're working on an IPO right now. It's possible that Digit could be, you know, it's 2.3 billion value for us. It easily could be three, $4 billion value. And nobody has ever said to you, oh, I hate Prem because I don't like the Digit deal. They don't even know about the Digit deal. Right. So, uh, yeah, 20 plus bagger. Yeah. It's <laughs> well, been a 14 uh, times just, so. just to be a little bit, I mean, we'll see when it, when it prices, but I don't disagree with you. No, no, no. It, it they, they, it, the price, the, the 2.3 billion is the last round of funding, like from six months ago. So, my, my only point is, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying, like, uh, I've seen enough exciting growth valuations go away that I just, you know, we'll see. That's all I'm saying. And I agree with you. It's it's object. I wish I had an investment like that. I'm not trying to like crap on it. Don't get me wrong. I'm just no. That's not. so. Uh, I was in India um, right before the uh, pandemic started on the Fairfax India trip, where you you know twenty or thirty of us went to India and, and visited all the subsidiaries from Fairfax India. So you go to the airport in, in Bangalore. That is as good an asset as, as I've ever seen. It's a monopoly. It's a terribly, terrifically growing city. It's a great airport. They're doing a crazy amount of business. They've got a great CEO, and we own 50% of it. And we've made a lot of money on it so far, and we're going to make a ton more. That's also going to go public in, in the next six months or a year. So, and, you know, India now is in a funny place because the world seems to divide on a China-India axis. Either people are big in China or they're big in India. They're typically not big in both. We're big in India at Fairfax because of Prem and, and Prem's relationship. And Prem is a big deal in India. And we're, we see more deals as a non-Indian investors as probably anybody else, with the exception maybe like somebody like Brookfield or something. But in terms of deals, deal flow and, and insurance and banking, Prem's, Prem's getting the phone call almost before anybody else is. So we, we, we're not paying a penny for that. I mean, none of this stuff we're really paying for. That's the thing that makes it so exciting is you get the whole India card for free. You know, any future deals that come out of there, whether it's our relationship, Prem's relationship with Modi or with, with every other business leader in the country and his, his respect and why people want to partner with him. And, and he has a terrific relationship there. Um, that's gratis. You know, they're not calling Warren Buffett for that. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about Fairfax India and how that works within Fairfax? Yeah. So Fairfax India um, is controlled by, by Fairfax. They IPO'd it eight years ago. And so we're heading to um, the, the end of the third performance period. So every three years, they, they, they have to pay a performance fee to Fairfax, um, which is based on 20% of the growth in book value above a 5% CAGR for the book. And effectively, that you know, there's about 100, I'm going off memory here, but there's about, I think there's 140 million shares outstanding of Fairfax India. Um, half of that, half of the value is, 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 in, is in the airport. Arguably, if you were to value the airport at fair value, the NAV, instead of being you know, $19 a share, is probably closer to 25 or something like that. 
uh, versus the stock trading around 14. The CAGR on the return since they launched the closed-end fund uh, on the investments has been about 10%. Uh, and then fees, uh, you know, knock that down about a percent. So you're, you're talking about a nine percent type uh, annual CAGR uh, on the investment, which is has beaten the Indian uh, indices, uh, the benchmarks in U.S. dollars. But uh, despite that, the the discount has grown significantly, and I, and I think that's a symptom of um, just how markets have changed, you know, over the past nine years. Quite frankly, when it first IPO'd, and even through the first performance fee, it was trading at NAV or at a premium to NAV. And then I think the onset of um, or the popularity of, of ETFs, uh, and passive ETFs, uh, drew a lot of that capital away. I think uh, the fact that it's um, the, the growth in passive uh, grew, took a lot of that capital away. Fairfax India is not in any ETF because it's uh, even though it's a big market cap in Canada, um, it doesn't have any. It, it's it's operations. It's a hold co, so it, it doesn't have any uh, operations in Canada. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's not considered for the for the TSX. So I think I think for that those reasons primarily and and, and liquidity has been low, the stock is traded to a big discount to uh, to book value, and they've taken advantage of it by buying back a lot of stock. Um, you know they they really do um, are consistent that way. And Fairfax Financial, the, the parent, has also been, been buying stock as well. Um, their partner in in Fairfax India is again Omers. Uh, Omers owns twenty million shares from the IPO. And they also took a stake uh, in Anchorage, uh, which is the whole code that's being used to IPO the airport. And that's how the most recent valuation for the airport um, is being used. Recently, the company bought another um, 10% uh, of the airport, and, and they closed, I think, on 3% of that. And they still have to close on the second half, which would probably be later in the fall. And that's kind of an indication to me that they're cleaning up the structure before they actually uh, complete the or, or go ahead with the IPO. They've talked about the IPO since 2021. So I know Charlie said, you know, the next six to 12 months, he expects that to happen. I don't know if that's going to happen in the next six to 12 months. They've been talking about it for two year, two and a half years already. You're not going to IPO something before travel is at its uh, back. Yeah, that's true. It could, it could be that they slow down the process as opposed to the regulators. I'm prone to blame the regulators um, because there's a lot of bureaucracy in India. If there's, if there's a knock on India, it's the bureaucracy. Um, and I think that's getting better uh, under Modi, but it's still um, there's still a long way to go. But Fairfax India is also a very exciting portfolio because when, when you look at the stuff inside Fairfax India, it really benefits from economic growth and uh, and all the infrastructure spending that's happening. Um, and so I think I think there's a there's there's um, really solid returns there as well. And it's a it's um, you know my my position in Fairfax India is probably a fifth of my position in Fairfax. Um, because I do want to have direct exposure because Fairfax um, is so big um, that Fairfax India gets diluted away a little bit. Yeah, it's not that material to the performance of, of Fairfax. Um, you know, Fairfax has other Indian investments that are not inside Fairfax India that are either legacy or insurance based. So the digit is held directly by Fairfax, not by Fairfax India. Um, you know, uh, CAS and and uh, um, and and. Uh, uh, the travel agency as well. Thomas Cook uh, is owned directly by Fairfax and, and not by Fairfax India. So there's a couple of things that that are, are there's other exposure to India in, in Fairfax, but you don't get as direct exposure to Fairfax India if you're not buying it directly. And, and my, my thought on Fairfax India is that if the IPO does happen or when it does happen, it will eventually, um, that there's a chance um, that you get a really big valuation because it's being listed in India and people actually like Prem uh, in India. <laughs> Whereas here, um, you know, it could be that people rush to buy Fairfax India to get exposure to that IPO at some point, and that will be the. You're talking about the airport. The airport, yeah, that would be the catalyst to close a discount. You know, massively high ROIC, toll road, uh, continued uh, growth. I I could see that asset trading very very strong. Yeah, and I think the idea with that asset, or why they're they're packaging it in in Anchorage as opposed to just saying we're taking the airport public. Is because Anchorage then can be used to make to raise more capital and do further infrastructure transactions at a really low cost of capital. We can't raise capital at Fairfax India. I mean, I think I think the goal when it was when it was listed um, was to try to set up a structure that would promote it trading at a premium to book value, and that hasn't worked out because of how the market has changed. Um, so there's no op- they don't have the opportunity to raise uh, more capital at Fairfax India unless they do some unless they you know turn over assets. Uh, which they have done uh, some of that, but ideally, I think they they would want to be able to, to use Anchorage as a vehicle to grow in India, 
and that would really accelerate the growth for for Fairfax India, uh, the parent. Um, and I think again, potentially close the discount. But you know, that's you can't bet on you know you should be betting on closing the discount. It's betting on that the interest rate value is going to keep going up. Charlie, you got anything to add? Look, we we see lots of deals in India. We're going to continue to see good deals there. People want to do business with Prem. They really like Prem. So I, I think we we just have the wind to our back. And, and, and that's largely going to be a function of how the Indian you know, world does. But I feel pretty optimistic. I'm not the only one. So maybe it's a conventional view that the next 10 or 15 or 20 years are going to be generally good for India. They're probably the only weakness in the Indian business model is if oil goes to $150 a barrel. Because in that case, they, they don't have any natural resource oil to speak of. They got a little bit offshore, but not a lot to speak of. That's probably the biggest, they're probably the biggest Achilles heel is energy in India. But uh, the, the workforce and the population, they're young, they're growing, and they're politically correct now because that's if you're going to offshore shore from China, you're going to go to places like Vietnam or India, and India is going to be a big beneficiary because they haven't been in the past. And, and Modi's really popular, so he's going to win re-election. And uh, for good or bad about Modi, he's pro-business. Yeah, Prem, uh, I'm pretty sure that there was uh, – he he spoke positively of him, which, as you said, he uh, they have a good relationship or whatever, but um... – yeah, I I I think uh, you know I heard, I was listening to a recent Greenblatt um, interview, and one of the things that I kind of wonder if it's lost a little bit. Um, I, I feel like a lot of discussion, and maybe maybe I'm not having discussion with the right people. That's uh, possible, but uh, a lot of discussion is about return on invested capital and Ashif. To your point, these quality businesses. One of the things that Greenblatt said that I think sometimes is lost in the conversation is you want long reinvestment runways also, right? Because uh, you want a good return times the capital deployed to put it out. And one of the things that is uh, viscerally something that is exciting about India is you would think that there's a lot of um, possible over time to, to reinvest the capital. Now, whether or not you bump up against parts of your business where the motor roads and whatever that's, you know, it's a different discussion, but it, it just seems set up for a scenario where there's more potential for capital reinvestment and therefore potential actually intrinsic value compounding as opposed to, I, I don't know, some, some... I think that's true, but unfortunately, it doesn't, um, it doesn't screen very well, right, Fairfax India. And, and the, way, you know, the way that people um, tend to buy stocks now, especially if you're an active manager is that you, first it has to be in your benchmark and it's, it's in no one's benchmark. So that immediately um, make, makes that people are, you know, don't want to invest in it. And then, you know, the, the returns aren't steady, right? Cause it's a, uh, it's a whole co um, they don't consolidate everything uh, that they own. Um, so the earnings aren't consistent and persistent. Um, and that's another reason why quants wouldn't want to own it. So you, you end up, you know, having just a, a much smaller shareholder base, but I think you're right. I think the, the reinvested capital are, are very high. Why would quants not want to own something that because they just get flipped in and out of it uh, if it doesn't have consistent? I think quants, and this is, I, I'm not a quant expert or anything. I've just you know just been listening to a lot of uh, things and reading a lot of things and and to try to understand why the stocks I own are so cheap. <laughs> you know, um, I, I try to figure that out. I, you know, ever since I started at UBS, um, that was that was basically my job: is why is something trading where it's trading uh, when it's clearly worth a lot more. And I think with quants, they they really want to see um, low variability in earnings quarter to quarter and low variability in earnings estimates. That shows a, a sign of a very predictable business, um, which is a sign of quality. And so I think I think that's why there's so much capital attributed to those types of businesses, um, and why those multiples get pretty high. I mean, you know, Charlie, I remember we, we talked about um, Costco. Charlie used to be, uh, own, own Costco and he sold it to buy Fairfax. How dare you, Charlie? You're supposed to never <laughs> sell Costco. I know, I know. I broke a, a, a sacred rule. <laughs> but when you look at Costco, it's that steady 12 and it trades at, you know, 35 times earnings or whatever it is. I don't know what it is now. I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, but but you know it's it's very predictable. It's a very good business, and it grows really well. And 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 you know when we talked about it uh, at the time contemporaneously, it was like, why is that multiple ever going to go down? There's who's going to sell it. <laughs> um, passive is always going to buy it, um, and and the rest of the investors are pretty uh, have you know giant gains and have no reason to sell. 
um, because it's working. Um, so, so, you know, it, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's, it's worth a lot. It's a great business. Uh, is it trading close to intrinsic value? Probably. But that doesn't mean that the forward returns can't be, you know, 12% a year, which is, you know, is very good for almost anyone. Right. So, you know, I, my hurdle is 10, you know, so, so, you know, if you can get 12, you're, you're in a good place. Now that multiple might shrink and that's where you might hurt your future expected returns. But, you know, that's impossible to predict if, if and when that, that will ever happen. It, it could get high, it could go higher, which has happened for the past, you know, uh, decade at least. So, Bill, if you think about Fairfax, one of the advantages that, you know, I think of Fairfax and Markel and Berkshire as kind of a big three for me. And one of the advantages that Buffett has is he's got the fortress balance sheet. Uh, he's got a bunch of Buffett's got a bunch of advantages. Number one, he's so damn smart, it's scary. Even at 92 or 93, he's smarter than anybody else we know, anybody else I know. And the guys at Markel, I really like them, and they're super smart too. One advantage that Prem has is he can do deals outside of North America in a way that the two of those companies can't do as well. So we're buying, we own 44% of a company called Gulf Insurance. They're going to, they're, this is, we've been an investor for a while. Uh, last year, they did two and a half billion in premium. We're essentially buying out the large shareholder and they gave us a note that we're going to pay back over four years and we're going to use essentially the earnings from the company to pay back the note. And then we're going to do a tender for the 10% that's publicly held that we don't own. And then at the end of this, we're going to have two and a half, three billion dollar company. They ran it on 92% combined last year. We're going to own 100% of that and it's going to be insurance premiums in the Gulf states. Now, I don't think Berkshire, I don't think Markel could have done that deal. And we, we already, we owned 44%. Now we own 100%. So we've got, we've got insurance companies in all these places, you know, whether it's, whether it's in India or, the, or in, you know, in places, even in the Ukraine, we have an insurance company, which Prem's done a lot to try to help protect those employees. But we have the, the, the top one or two or three PNC companies in the Ukraine. It's all business. They do like 100 million or something, 150 million of um, premiums every year. Uh, but but we have a, we have them in, in South America, in, in Asia, all over. And that, that's a, that's a place that's going to grow for us over time. But then let's think about this um, uh, deal we just did with uh, with Kenny Wilson. We bought with Kenny Wilson's help. We're we're funding essentially two billion dollar portfolio of mostly multifamily loans that were in the PacWest portfolio. So PacWest, of course, SNL had lots of trouble. They need to sell. So it's a bit of a vulture investment. Other people could have done it, but we did it. So that's a deal that it was too small. Buffett's not going to buy a $2 billion loan portfolio. Markel could have. They just don't have the, We have a long, long-term relationship with Kenny Wilson. We're on speed dial with them. So we do it. Now, what does that mean for us? We're going to put out $2 billion at 10% versus money we were earning at five. So we're going to earn an extra $100 million a year. It's two, three-year money, and then it'll burn off if it goes well. And then we're going to earn an extra four dollars a year for the next three years from that one deal. It's in our bond portfolio. We just allocate some bonds instead of having eighty percent of the bonds we have or government bonds. We'll have a little bit less, um, not a lot less, because we've got forty billion of them. So we're taking two two billion of the forty and 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 up clipping. But this is a really nice deal. It's based on Prem's relationship, a long term relationship with Kenny Wilson, who who we've had a good relationship with. We've made money with. We get the phone call. We do the deal. It's kind of classic Buffett, like 1993 deal that, that he doesn't do that anymore. You know, when I was younger in my 20s and 30s, every two months or three months, Buffett would be on the, the column in the journal, the, the little, you know, uh, summary column with, with something he was doing. He bought 5% of this or 5% of that. You don't, Buffett's really quiet now. It's a little sad to me because there's very little going on at Berkshire now, unless you're you're seeing stuff that that I don't see. There's not much happening there. You know, mainly he's made a ton of money in Apple, and that was brilliant. Um, but he's not taking a lot of five percent positions anymore. No, he's taking a thirty percent position in Oxy instead. But yeah, yeah. But you're right. I mean, he's he's trying. He's got such size. It's uh, it's tough. Yeah. So, and, and and talking to the guys in the annual meeting at Fairfax with Brian Bradstreet, uh, who runs their bond portfolio, they've got forty billion in bonds, eighty percent are in government, three year duration. And what Brian said to me is, our plan is when rate when the recession starts, our government bonds will become more valuable because there'll be a, a movement to credit most likely. And then what we're going to do is we're going to redeploy 
the, from from governments to corporates, and we're going to move to like single A corporates and pick up another two or three hundred basis points at some point of the cycle. That's what their, their plan is. It doesn't mean they're going to do it, um, but I think that these guys have been through have been through number cycles. I think they know what they're going to do, and and I think that we're the shareholders are in really good hands. It's funny. I was having a similar conversation with a friend. Uh, we were talking about the tenure at four and uh you know if shit hits the fan it's going to get bid so it gets bid higher than par you collect for in the interim and it's a nice option value right but those are macro those are macro timing thoughts right so i think it, it kind of goes back to like I, I think people's objection but i don't necessarily think it's a bad way to think uh, i mean i'm thinking that way myself so <laughs> i'm not going to say it's bad it's a, it's about keeping optionality i think right i think i think the I think with that portfolio, by keeping as much as it is in, in government bonds, again, making a fair return already, and it's quite certain. And there's no reason to extend out and take that extra risk for, for clipping an extra 100 basis points. But most of the peers do do that. You know, they, they do have, uh, when they have float businesses, they do, you know, invest more in corporates, even when, you know, spreads are tight, because they're trying to maximize their current return, because uh, that's how they get incentivized, right? They're paid on that. And they think that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, whereas for for Fairfax, it's much more of a long term approach, keeping optionality and taking advantage of dislocations, um, which is exactly what you want, I think, in a capital allocator. Yeah, I guess I guess one of the questions would be, could you do it yourself? But you're hiring a capital allocator in this in this instance, right? So you've already said I'd rather have Prem run some some of my money than myself. Therefore, do I like how he does it? Right, which is how I think about it. Not only that, you're getting the leverage, right? I mean, it's the operating leverage. Like Charlie said earlier, it's over two thousand dollars of assets working for you when you're buying a stock for you know seven hundred and twenty-five. So you're getting tons of operating leverage, and and two thirds of that operating leverage is coming from float, which is pretty close to risk-free. You know, some of those mortgages have some risk, obviously, but I think the LTVs were fifty-one percent. Um, so I'm not too worried. And I think the and the bond portfolio, obviously, it's U.S. Treasuries. It's 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 the definition of risk free. So so you're you're getting all of that exposure for free. And you know, I don't hold a lot of cash in my own portfolio. I'm 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 feeling like a bit of a cowboy right now because I have a little bit of leverage on because um, I keep buying more Fairfax when I, I don't have any money, um, um, which hopefully works out, but it might not. Uh, you know, I, you can't account for short term moves. Um, you know, I look. I, I, when I look at the stock now, I thought, "Oh, we're going to blow through a thousand easy." When after people see that Q one, where we earn like you know forty four dollars a share, and and we didn't, and then I realized, "Oh, it's a big figure. A thousand dollars is a big number. Lots of people are going to want to take profits at a thousand, uh, just because it's it's a thousand. Uh, not really looking at the value, because you know, I think that, I mean, almost every investor I talk to trades off a of price. They're not trading off a of value. Um, they're trying to get ahead of the next narrative. And make and make a quick buck, and and they might tell themselves that they're fundamentally investing, but for the most part, um, the stocks that they're trading are trading in their intrinsic value range already. Whereas whereas for Fairfax, it's 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 so far below its intrinsic value, especially if you believe you know what Buffett says about float, and you think the insurance business is of high quality. If you don't, you know, if someone doesn't think the insurance business is of high quality, you can't give a lot of credit to the float because it might go away. Um, but um, but I think with you know, the, the track record that Fairfax has put up, I'm willing to say that I think they have a high quality insurance business. And so does, you know, so do the uh, credit rating agencies and, and the insurance uh, rating agencies like AM Best. Um, they, they also think that. Um, and but the proof will be in the pudding, right? We'll see what we'll see how, how it how it works going forward. But I think, um, I think you, you combine the fact that we're at that $1,000 level. Um, and that um, that we're heading into a hurricane season, um, you know, people are prone to to take profits because they're afraid of a drawdown, um, and that's that's a common theme. At some point, hurricane insurance has to be a good business. As someone that lives here, I I don't know. People aren't going to stop buying it. I'll tell you that because people can't afford it. It's either going to become state run or it's going to become a, a decent business because everybody has fled. But it's it's not easy to get wind right now. Uh, on a house in Florida. It's not going to be easier next year. I, I mean, I'm going the, the house we're building. I'm going X wind, you know, I mean, just, just how you think about, you know, valuation, 
just like very back of the envelope, I'm thinking, okay, if they're compounding at 18% book value per share over 37 years, uh, you can make a pretty credible argument that 1.2, 1.3 times makes a lot of sense, maybe even a little higher, right? It really depends what your expected return is, right? I mean, if it, if it, you know, traditionally with financials, um, you know, there used to be, and and I think outside of Fairfax and some other names uh, that I own in particular, um, there's a big discrepancy between the. Um, there used to be a, a really a, a strong relationship, excuse me, between ROE and price to book. Um, so if you have a 15% ROE, you should trade at one and a half times book. If you have a 10% ROE, you should trade at one times book. Was kind of the the, the rule of thumb. And it, it kind of holds for a lot of the other names. In fact, I, th- I think in some of the cases like, you know, the ROEs are lower and the, and the price to books are higher because the expected return on some names has gone down because they're considered of such high quality. You know, Markel, I think is a good example of that. And, and we'll see how much more, how much better Markel does now that interest rates are, are higher. I think that's, it's really bullish for them too, because they also have a float. Um, it's just a lot smaller than, than Fairfax's. And and I think I think ultimately um, on, from from that from a valuation perspective, it makes sense that we would trade, you know, one and a half times for a long term goal on 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 growing ROE at fifteen percent, which is the stated goal of, of the company. But right now, you know, I I think if you if you think about how much we probably earned in Q two and and you know throwing earnings estimates out for for an insurance company is is you know you know you're going to be wrong. But there's a good chance that you know 850 in book is a pretty reasonable number that we get to by the time they report. Um, you know, when they report in a few weeks, and and so one and a half times book gives you you know a lot of upside. Um, you know, versus where we are now um, since we're trading you know below below book to to begin with. And I think the catalyst to to, to get there um, is going to come from um, you know closet indexers in Canada. Quite frankly, um, you know Fairfax is. Um, between 75 and 80 basis points uh, on, in the S&P TSX composite. It's outperformed the index um, by a large margin over the past three years. So it's getting bigger and bigger and more relevant. Anyone who doesn't own it, who's benchmarked to the TSX uh, composite, um, sees it as detracting from their performance every month, every six months, every year. And eventually they're going to they're gonna say, you know, get me back to neutral. You know, let me buy it to get to market weight so I don't have to feel that pain anymore. Um, and it's a very similar thing that happened to Constellation Software, you know, five years ago. It hit a thousand, has about the same number of shares outstanding. I think that's twenty two point one. We have twenty three point two. And and lo and behold, that's the, because the fundamental performance kept being strong. It was absolutely the right decision for all those, you know, value PMs that said I can't buy Constellation because it looks too expensive to reconsider how they value stocks. You know, they they. They, they change their, their, how they value stocks. And there was a lot of evidence around that they should be changing it. You had stuff like Google and Microsoft and Apple and all these, all these um, tremendous growers um, that are not big capital users that are compounders. And, and they saw that and they went ahead and, 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 and upped their weights in, in Constellation. And the stock you know, ran from 1,000 then to you know, 2,700 or so, or wherever it is now, um, and continued to outperform the index. Again, because the fundamentals also confirm that. And I think with Fairfax, given the valuation we're starting at, that's not a hurdle for, for investors. A hurdle, I think, for a lot of investors is the history. Um, they've had a bad experience in the past. And I think a similar thing happened from a value perspective, uh, from an index perspective to Fairfax uh, back in 95. Like if I, if I was sell UBS, I'd have access to Bloomberg and I, I, would, I would have done all the work <laughs> to confirm this, but I, I don't have it. So it's just a, just a theory. You know, from '95 to '98, uh, Fairfax's um, book value grew from you know 40 US to I think 112 US, um, and the stock went from 90 Canadian to uh, 590 Canadian at one point in '98. Uh, while they issued three million shares, they took the share count from nine million to 12.1 million, I think, at that time. So the market cap went up so much, I think, because everyone had to chase it, and the and the price to book value grew from 1.8 times uh, to over three times. Um, I wouldn't suggest anyone buy the stock at three times book value. Um, and my guess is that most people, uh, or most of that buying came from these index chasers who just couldn't take the pain anymore uh, of not owning it. Um, and that, and that leads to a lot of bad feelings when the stock hit 600 in, uh, in, uh, in 1999, 590 or, or 1998. And, um, and then, you know, fast forward to now and it, it's, it's not that much higher than that. And so, so I think I think the valuations, you know, got ahead of themselves uh, at several times. 
Um, and I think a lot of people have, you know, you know, bad memories uh, or, or attribute um, that, you know, Prem was making bad decisions and everyone knew that he was making bad decisions when he made it. You know, at the time he had all the hedges on, which is a big, um, big pushback on Fairfax. The previous had a lot of hedges on, which is the macro, you know, a macro bet that was made, which I think was made to protect the insurance business. Because if you're really worried about negative interest rates, then what happens to your float? Does your float start losing money? Um, do you go to all cash? How do you how do you mitigate? You have to take a lot more credit risk. Um, and so I think he I think he thought about that holistically and thought I need to save the business and had those shorts on. And you know the market loved it. Uh, they took the the price to book was even at the, when he was in the midst of taking the the hedges off. It was we were at one point three book times book. Fairfax raised money in twenty sixteen at that valuation. They sold a million shares at one point three times book. Which you know was not that far from the current share price. Quite frankly, it was like seven hundred Canadian or something that they sold those shares, um, and then they went on to buy Allied World, um, which has been just a giant growth vehicle. So it's a bit of it's a bit of the Henry Singleton approach, which Prem talks about a lot, where he issued equity when his valuation was high, um, and he buys it back when it's cheap. Um, and you know, not only did they do the buyback but on the substantial issuer bid that that Charlie mentioned before from the sale of Odyssey, but they also did a total return swap on their own shares. Um, you know. You can give Prem and Fairfax a lot, of, a lot of grief, but they are creative <laughs> as to how they make money for for shareholders. You know, the total return swap at the time they put it on when interest rates were zero was probably entirely paid for by the dividend, and and now they're probably paying for it, but they're up 100 percent, over 100 percent on that on that position. Um, so it's made you know 800 million or, or whatever it is um, of returns on those 1.9 million shares that they bought through the TRS. So the actual share count, even though it's 23.2. Arguably, those two million shares, you know, are never going to come back out again. Um, so the float's probably actually a lot smaller than it, than it looks. Yeah, I was just playing with some numbers while Ashif was talking. So our book is eight hundred three. Um, we've got a couple of transactions that haven't closed, including this uh, golf transaction. We're going to pick up uh, about seventeen dollars of book value from those that they've already come out and said. So uh, it'd be hard not to be at. At eight fifty, there weren't a lot of uh, big events in the second quarter. Second quarter is not a big event quarter for insurance, so we should be at eight fifty in book um, when we report. Then I think what if 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 companies right and and Ashif and I are right, there's another four fifty of earnings that are going to happen over the next three years. So you go from eight fifty and you add four fifty to that, you're at thirteen hundred dollars. So if we don't get a multiple expansion, you double your money. This is a good way to think about it. We stay at 0.9 or, or 1 Between now and then, you get a double. If we get a multiple expansion on the 1300, all of a sudden the number becomes starts to become big because you're going to go from 7 to 16, 1700. You're talking 120, 130 percent return in three years. So that's really at the end of the day, that's really the investment thesis which is a mediocre, a mediocre outcome, you get a double and you get a triple with a good outcome over a three, three year period. And if we're wrong, it might take an extra year. How do you guys think about a bad outcome? If you get a giant or in the insurance business, my, here's my simple view is I own Montpelier Ray when uh, her, when the Katrina hit and it was so bad that they had to recapitalize the company. So you got crammed as an, as the stock went, I don't, I don't remember exactly, but it went from like 20 to 10. Then the, my, my share counts are off, but they got killed. If you survive the hurricane, and that's really what will kill you, it's a hurricane or an earthquake, but it, I think it's going to be the hurricane that, that will hurt the property casualty business. If you survive and don't have to do a recap, you will make it back in the next couple of years because the, the rates, whatever they are, as high as they are now, will be up another 50% or 30% the year after the hurricane hits. That's the, the big one. So as long as we survive, we're going to be fine. And the question is, do we have assets to, to, to sh send overboard to, to, to push back to the, uh, the parent company to, to do that? And I think we have enough. I think we, we could sell other non-related assets. We could sell things in India. We could sell other assets we have. We could sell our piece in Atlas if we had to. That's a, almost a $2, $2 billion piece of, of you know, a ship real estate. So I think we have things we could do to create to create funds to make sure we don't get knocked out of the business, Ashif. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think that's I think I think that's the major risk um, is some giant catastrophe that you know is is so big that it, it causes us a problem. I mean, if that happens, there'll be I think a lot of insurance businesses will, will be in trouble. 
Um, and it, you know, I, th- I think the, the people said like it'd be two category five hurricanes and an earthquake in California in the same year, um, is, is a real, you know, that's, that's probably your outside event, um, that can, that can, it will wipe out a decent amount of capital and then you have to, you know, rebuild it as long as you again, survive it. So that's the risk. I mean, it's all, it's, you know, it is a probability adjusted, um, you know, bet. And, and I think the reason why it's, it's, there's such big positions for us is the probability on some of these events that are going to cause you to, to lose money, um, seem like they're very, very low. So, you know, you, you go into it knowing that there's a really bad outcome, but the odds are so low, uh, that it seems improbable. And, and that's why I think, you know, we've made the positions as, as big as we have. And I don't suggest anyone gets as big as we have in, in these positions, but, um, you know, I, I think you need to do your own work and, and get your own, uh, be comfortable with the risk. But the, the timing I think is super interesting because, you know, when book value is growing three to 5% uh, a quarter, um, it's going to provide support for, for buying. And, and again, I think the, I think, you know, when, when Charlie talks about, you know, fundamentally, it seems like, you know, without multiple expansion, you know, you're still going to make, um, you know, almost two times your money in, in, uh, in three years. At worst, in five years, it should be a fifteen percent, you know, return a year, which is pretty darn good, um, anyways. But if we're also right on the index um, chase um, aspect of it, those numbers could look very small. Um, you know, we have a very, you know, good shareholder base, I think, um, and I think that's that's confirmed by you know how how illiquid the the shares are, um, and we'll see what it takes to get the shares out of people's hands if if um, if you know these buyers come in to try to get to market weight. Um, and, um, and that's why I think the right tail is open and I want to have exposure to that right tail because, you know, I, I think, um, uh, Ohio capital on Twitter, um, who, who seems like a great guy. Um, he, he has, he said, you know, if they can take your book value 15% a year for the next five years or next, the next 10 years, they could easily see five X in the, in the shares from here. Um, and that, and I did the math and that, that works out to a 1.1 times book value. Um, if it gets a five X in 10 years, 1.1 is not a very demanding book value multiple based on historical and based on the comps, uh, now, let alone after, a, 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 you know, 10 years of a row of 15% Kager in book value, it could get higher. You know, it, it, it becomes 10 times. So it goes to 2.2 times book, which is, you know, where Berkeley trades. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not crazy to think that there's five to 10 times upside here. And I know it's aggressive saying that in a public setting and, and on a podcast, but, um, I think, I think you want to have exposure to that right tail, but not count on it, right? No one should be betting on that outcome. Uh, but it's nice to have that exposure when you seem to have fairly limited, you know, downside, um, on a probability adjusted basis. What is, uh, what does Berkeley do for those that don't know myself included? Yeah, they're, they're also a PNC insurer. Um, they're just more of a pure insurer. They're not, they're, they're returning capital through special dividends and buybacks and so on. They're not reinvesting the capital like Fairfax is. Fairfax, you know, Fairfax is more like Markel and, and, um, and, uh, Berkshire. And, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, with, with higher interest rates, I think there's a chance you get multiple expansion uh, on those names too. Um, but, um, you know, you look, you look back to like 1996, I was looking, I was, I was listening to, um, to Warren talk about, uh, or Mr. Buffett talk about, uh, float. And, and he said, um, you know, at the time, um, if, I, if I have the numbers correct, um, you know, the, the book value of Berkshire was twenty billion, um, the float was seven billion, and Berkshire was trading at forty billion. And you know, he said, you know, the stock's trading in the intrinsic in its intrinsic value range, so we're not, you know, we're not using the buyback right now. And and people were willing to, you know, pay that kind of premium because you know they're they're because of the historical returns, obviously. And and Berkshire is, you know. Because Buffett's Buffett, he's been able to keep up, you know, producing incredible returns so that it wasn't a bad idea to buy it at that price, even though it looked, you know, expensive um, versus, you know, traditional metrics. Um, but, you know, at, at, that, at that time, he said, you know, if someone offered me uh, $7 billion for the float, unencumbered with no taxes, but it meant that we couldn't invest in the insurance business anymore, he wouldn't take the money um, because the value of the float generation is so big. Um, and the income off of that float forever is so valuable that it would it would it wouldn't make sense. Um, I don't know what Prem would say if you asked him the same question now. If you if you ask Prem, would you take thirty two or thirty five billion wherever the float is today, and took it for uh, in, in cash, uh, but you couldn't compete in the insurance business anymore? Would he take it? 
I mean, it's a much tougher question for Prem because he's trading at, he's getting no value for that float at all. Uh, he's trading below book value. Um, it would triple the stock price in, in, in one go. Uh, but, you know, they wouldn't have the insurance business anymore. Um, and I don't know what his answer would be, but you know, I might ask him uh, at the next AGM. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we'll see how he answers. Nice. I like it. Charlie, anything? Yeah. What, what I'd say, Bill, is look, I, I'm involved with a handful of of, of, of things. Uh, Sheaf and I have some of these in common where the stock price really matters. In, in consolidated communications, there's a there's a an indication of interest at four dollars. The stock's three eighty. If the stock was four fifty, it would really help. And and so my point is, if I came on a podcast or pitched this and tried to get the stock up, it really helps me. At Fairfax, there's really no. I'm not concerned whether Fairfax trades at seven thirty or eight thirty or eight nine fifty anytime soon. I'm not a seller in any time in any reasonable time frame. Um, I think the reason why I thought it was fun to come on the podcast is it's more of a reputational thing, which is we see this giant fat pitch and some people are saying it's not as fat as you think or it is or it isn't. And I think Kashif and I were talking and we really want to be put a put a foot down here and say, look, this is what we saw on, you know, July 8th or July 10th. Um, this is a big, giant fat pitch. And and you know, give us a grade in a year or two and see how we do or three years because we really want to, th- we want this one to be the one where we get graded on. All right. Well, that happens to be why I said yes, because I don't often do these kind of op- uh, episodes. And I've known Ashif for long enough that he said, you know, uh, it would be fun for us to come on and be on record. And I said, you know, what the hell? I, 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 I like, I like you guys. I, I enjoyed hanging out and uh, I've known Ashif now for long enough that He's never said that before. And I said, well, if you say it once in three years, that's acceptable to me. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't mind. So, Thanks for having us on, Bill, because um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the podcast and a big fan of yours. And, and um, I think uh, I think your approach is great. And I wish there were more of you, um, you know, in, on, in the financial community. So, um, you know, I, part of my motivation uh, besides, you know, the reputational thing, which is nice because uh, it's always nice to have credibility with people. Um, is uh, I just want people to make money, you know. I, I think I think I want to encourage people to think long term and, and to buy money and, and, and to make money because I, you know, given my background at UBS, you know, we we, um, you know, my training was to trade pretty short often, was to try to make profits quickly, uh, trade around positions a lot. And I think over the past you know five years, as the market's changed, I've had to change the way I think, and and it's, it's I, I've adjusted to thinking more long term. I didn't have the same you know Buffett training that that Charlie had early. Um, it all kind of like, you know, the last five years has really changed my, my mind and, and knowing Charlie for the past, um, four years has been a big part of that. We met at, uh, uh, EL financial AGM four years ago, uh, which we both, you know, both still own. Um, and, uh, and he was, he's been a great help in opening my eyes and to see how this uh, insurance business, um, uh, actually works, the PNC insurance business. Um, and, uh, I just, I've learned so much about Fairfax in the past two years. I can't wait to see what the next uh, twenty years looks like. I like it. I I need to uh, I need to crack open something on EL Financial. Uh, that's that sounds pretty interesting to me. I've um you know with with Fairfax, it's been one of those things that I've I've got like uh, I got a big position in in Berkshire, and then um, my my family when uh, came from insurance, and when we sold that business, somebody said put it in Chubb to my grandma. So I've had like a pretty concentrated uh, insurance like portfolio anyway that I haven't really wanted to add to it. Um, but the Chubb position is now gone. So uh, that may change. I think with Fairfax, what you, what you also get is not only do you get the, um, you know, the discount valuation, the giant flow in the insurance business, but you really arguably you're paying for the insurance business or even half price for the insurance business. If you really want to be aggressive on how you value flow um, and you're getting everything else for free and everything else are real assets. You know, there are a lot of real assets. It's a shipping business, um, there's a gold mine, there's a copper mine, there's a natural gas exposure, um, there's Greek banks, there's Greek tra- a Greek travel company, you know, all the Indian assets. I mean, you're getting a lot of real, uh, real businesses as part of it. And I think, you know, in this, in this macro environment, um, you know, which I don't know where anything's going to go, but um, I think, I think most things people think will benefit from lower interest rates. Well, this one benefits from rates being high for the, for the float. But the rest of the portfolio might benefit if interest rates go lower. So I think I think you, you kind of have a um, 
something that's exposed that has a lot of exposure that will benefit if you know if the U.S. dollar weakens, for example. I think I think Fairfax will do quite well because the international exposure. Um, I think the I think the bond portfolio does really well, obviously, uh, in higher interest rates. And even if rates go down, the float's going to keep growing, so it's going to fill in uh, the earnings. So it's it's just um, I think I think it's it's a good addition to most people's portfolios because of how diversified and different it is than the rest. Um, you know, when you're buying, you're buying Berkshire, which is great, obviously the, the greatest, um, you're getting a lot of Apple. And I don't know, is Apple trading closer to intrinsic value? You know, Apple probably trades a lot closer to intrinsic value than Eurobank does in Greece, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I, I, I know enough to know that I don't know. But I, I agree with you that uh, it it does appear as though, but I would have said this 50% ago, but it does appear that Apple is reasonably full from a valuation standpoint. The thing that I, I, you know, I, I was thinking about the other day, I was like, I find it hard to hold Transdime and I, I like Transdime. Like I was going through the 10K, what they do is it's incredible. Like, but, but when you're, and when you're paying a, f- a free cash flow multiple in that instance, it's levered and they could probably roll the debt. That's not really a problem, but it's just like, it just seems to me that, uh, and, and Apple is similar to me. And again, I've been wrong, but it's like, man, things got to go really right here. And if they don't go right, like that's going to be pretty painful. And the probability is that they'll go right. Right. I mean, but that's kind of implied in the price. Like I'm not willing to bet against, um, th- you know, things going right for Apple and Transdime and all these things. So again, they're great business. They're amazing businesses, right? And 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 right when you look at the market structure, you know, uh, you know, besides that Nasdaq 100 rebalance that was announced today, um, you know, who's going to sell uh, Apple and and Transdime in these stocks because they're such great performers that you know they're going to be held by these portfolios as long as they have the characteristics. Now, what's going to crack? I, I don't know. I mean, there might be something that shows up at some day that makes people want to sell, or maybe. You know, there's a shift away from passive at some point, which makes which forces selling. Because um, I think I think Apple. I don't know what the numbers are now, but at one point it was like 23 percent owned by ETFs. Um, so so you you know you have the steady cash flow coming you know coming in to buy the stock. Why is it ever going to go go down? Is really what the question is. But I don't have to own it, uh, and I don't. Um, you know, but um, but something something I own like EL Financial, you know, might own some Apple if it, you know, it has a, you know, that that's a that's a different way of owning it. But I get to own it at half price then, so I don't feel as bad about it. And they're buying in shares, right? So yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I don't want to bet against those things going up, but I also you know don't want to have the FOMO that comes with not owning them, uh, which you know I have I've had for the past five years. You know, I used to own Apple at like a tenth of the current price, but I I sold it because I was taking profits too quickly back then. I wasn't thinking about the right tail enough. Um, and I don't want to make the same mistake with with Fairfax. Um, um, and you know, I know it's a, it's a it's a different kind of stock, but I I would argue the quality is is high as well. Um, it's just a lumpy fifteen versus um, the steady fifteen, maybe that uh, that Apple's giving you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good way to put it. I mean, some of these businesses are absolutely incredible, and it's awesome to watch them execute. But the stocks, I don't know, different different strokes for different folks, right? I mean, I think that's. You started out in the beginning uh, saying that you know expected value investing is maybe uh, not as in favor. I, I might say that people are favoring their perception of tighter ta- um, like tail outcomes. That seems to be really bit up. Um, but I agree with you. The lumpy kind of like not many people like to pitch. This could be a zero or it could be a ten, but the probability is thirty percent that it's ten and you know, whatever. Right. But so the expected value is quite nice. Um, but, but, uh, that th- those pitches, I don't, I don't see a lot of those and maybe it's a function of who I'm talking to there. It may be prevalent, but I don't see it. I, I kind of assume that everything I own has a 10% chance of a zero. And if the expected return is still high enough, um, then, then I still have to, you know, I still have to buy it, you know. Um, even if there's that chance, I, the, the the issue is sizing. And I, if anywhere I've struggled uh, in, in in my portfolio management, uh, my own portfolio with sizing, um, and I think that's where it gets interesting. Now, obviously, Fairfax is is a very big position because it's very diversified, and it's very cheap, and it's hard to see the downside. You know, I, I think I think Morgan Housel has a quote, you know, where you know risk is everything. After you count for everything, risk is what's left, you know, um, or something to that effect. And and I think um, and I think there, there's obviously a risk with any of these things. And I, I think I think knowing that going in is important. I think 
most investors have um, are heuristic based, where they will with 100% probability exclude things from their portfolio because it has a certain characteristic. Um, and, and that's, I think, what is providing opportunity uh, elsewhere. Um, and now most of the stuff I own is not in any index, you know, or, so it's not in anyone's benchmark and no one has to buy it. But Fairfax is different in that regard, is that there are people who are going to have to buy it uh, if they keep performing fundamentally because the market cap is going to get bigger and bigger and they can afford uh, not to be at least market weight because it's going to hurt their returns too much. And the only guys who have survived in the business, for the most part, uh, have been the ones who are really good at managing against the index. Um, you know, they might they might say that they're that they're fundamental investors, but really, you know, uh, from the actions that they, they take, it's really about beating the index, and that means being in everything um, that's beating the index. Uh, and if you're out of it for too long and it gets too big, then you risk um, underperforming, and then you lose your job. So I think I think there is real pressure. Uh, for these guys to buy Fairfax at some point. And it may not happen. I may be wrong about that. You know, I, I, I count for that, but it makes logical sense to me. And in talking to a lot of PMs on the street who I, you know, I used to work with, that's exactly what they're, that, that's exactly what they're seeing too. Um, you know, I was talking to a, 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 a broker or a trader at a, a sell side firm last week. And he's like, he goes, yeah, I had two guys come in and switch out of Canadian banks and life insurance to buy Fairfax. Um, and, and I think, and I, and I think it makes absolute sense that that's happening. And, it makes sense even from, from how it's trading that it's not going up in that scenario because most institutional buyers, uh, you know, buy on a, on, a, on a volume basis, like a VWAP basis, uh, whereas the sellers are price driven, right? They're saying it's close to 1,000. Uh, in fact, the further away it gets from 1,000, the more aggressive they're on selling because they're like, I don't want to miss getting close to 1,000. <laughs> I don't want to get this. I don't want to feel this drawdown pain because uh, it, obviously it's, it's turning down because the hurricane season's coming. And they're not really even thinking about how much, uh, how good earnings are going to be uh, in Q2. Um, and you know, you know, Q3 last year, you know, Fairfax had a combined ratio of hundred. So yeah, you know, Q3 is going to be tough, uh, almost certainly. Um, um, uh, it might be good. It might be really, really bad. Um, I don't think it matters when you're buying at this kind of price. Um, it's, it's kind of my point. Charlie ending thoughts. Look, this is a fun one. It's a big fat pitch. Buffett t- teaches us to swing hard when you see a fat pitch. I think we have a big bet on this and, uh, we look forward to coming back in uh, six months or a year or two, and we'll talk about how it went out. Yeah, we'll do we'll do a remind me of this podcast in about a year. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll get you to come up for the uh, Fairfax uh, meeting again in April. I'll come up. I I was up. Uh, yeah, I, I like Toronto. I think Toronto is a fun city. It reminds me of Chicago, except they ruin the uh, lakefront. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> I hope that it. I hope they do a good job because I really do like that city, and I I. Uh, I'm very fond of Canadians, good people. So, all right. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thank Thank you you guys for coming on. I appreciate it. It's our pleasure. Big fan. Thank you. Appreciate it.